Well, good evening. If you would please turn to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, and we read tonight beginning with verse 15. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Throughout the ages, there have been times when men seemed especially interested in angels. In fact, there have been times in sinful idolatry where people have actually tried to worship angels. And of course, the Bible is absolutely plain about the fact that no one is to be worshipped except God. In the book of Revelation chapter 19, we read where the Apostle John is overcome by what he's witnessing and paying homage to the angel that was communicating to him. The Bible tells us this, Revelation 19.9, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we don't have any doubt about the fact that we're not to worship the angels. But having acknowledged that, God has seen fit to reveal to us on the pages of Scripture a lot of information about the angels. In fact, we've already seen in the book of Daniel the presence of angels. Now, when the three Hebrew sons were cast into the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there was a fourth person in the midst of the flames with them. And we talked about how that may well have been a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, but if not, it was an angel. And in chapter 6, the Bible says it was an angel who shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Then in chapter 7, when Daniel was given the uh, vision of the four beasts, it was an angel who was used by God to give him the interpretation. And then here in chapter 8, in verses 15 through 19, we learn that the interpretation given to Daniel about the ram and the, the male goat, that interpretation was given to him through an angel. I want you to notice, first of all, with me tonight, Daniel's search for understanding. This is where we begin tonight, verse 15. Daniel's search for understanding. The Bible says this, When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now, the first thing I want you to notice with me there is Daniel's awareness. And this is fascinating to me. When you think about how God communicated to his prophets through revelatory dreams and visions, when you think about those men seeing these visions, I mean, I think we really ought to try to... to from time to time, put ourselves in the position of that man, someone like Daniel. And there you are receiving this information from God through a vision or through a dream. I mean, what was that like? What was that like? How did God communicate revelation to his prophets through visions and dreams? Well, one thing you see here is, uh, first of all, he understood this came from God. Uh, when it says in verse 15, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. That means there's something in the vision that is to be understood, something that is understandable. It has come to him from God. That's why he wants to understand it. Uh, you know, tonight if I have a dream and I wake up, I'm not going to spend any time trying to understand it. I know it's not revelation from God. 
Uh, it may be the chicken I ate tonight, or it may be pizza or something else, but it's not revelation from God. So I'm not going to worry about what it means. He uh, seeks to understand the meaning of what he's seen, so he understands it has meaning. He also understands, even as he's in the midst of this, that statement tells us that he knows there's some element of this that he's not grasping, that he's not getting a handle on. And when you put those two things together, he he knows this is information from God. He also knows he doesn't understand it. Then you realize that as God communicated to these prophets, they weren't passive. They were aware that he's communicating to them. They're alert. Their mind is at work. We can even say that their emotions were engaged. Because when when you read these visions he received and he talks about these beasts and how they were terrifying how he was frightened, then not only is his mind at work, but his his emotions are engaged. And so they're alert, and yet at the same time, they realize they're not the source of the information. The information is coming from outside them so that they struggle to understand it. In fact, the Bible tells us there were times that after they would write down what they received from God, they would go back over what they had received, striving to understand it better, try, striving to make sense of it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when He predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So there is the Spirit of God at work in them, indicating something about the sufferings of Christ and the glories of Christ, and they've received this revelation, they record this revelation, then they search it, trying to understand it better. And you get somewhat of a feel for this when you see what Daniel is doing here. He receives this vision, he's troubled by it, he doesn't understand it, and he seeks to understand it, he wants to understand it. So the first thing we see there is Daniel's awareness that he needs an understanding of this. Now, in verses 15 through 19, you begin to see God's answer. Because as he's seeking to understand it, behold, standing before him is one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. God is going to answer Daniel's desires to understand what he's seen, and God is going to communicate that answer by an angel. One stands before him having the appearance of a man. This is the angel Gabriel. And we see in other places, both in the Old and New Testaments, that angels would often make their appearance to men in the form of a man, in human form. I want to just show you one example of this. Keep your Bible marker here and go to the book of Genesis for a moment. Genesis chapter 19. An account that I know you're very familiar with, but I want to remind you of it. Genesis chapter 19. By the way, you will remember Hebrews 13.2, which says this, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. You remember that verse? Well, what does that verse refer to? It refers, I believe, back to what we read here in Genesis 18 and 19. I mean, has anybody ever entertained angels unaware as they showed hospitality to strangers? Genesis 19, look at verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords... Please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. What is he doing? He's showing hospitality, isn't he? They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? 
Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he's become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men, the angels, reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So here you have these angels who have the appearance of men, and Lot shows them hospitality he did not understand at, the, at that time. Until this time, he was entertaining angels. Look back, if you would please, in Daniel chapter 8. So Daniel is aware he needs more information. God's going to communicate what he desires to know, understanding about this vision he's seen, and he's going to do it by an angel who had the appearance of a man. It's also interesting to note that there's a sense in which, I mean, before Daniel even expresses his desire to understand it, God has already anticipated his desire. He, he expresses a desire to understand it, and behold, standing in front of him is this man who is going to explain it. It's encouraging to know that, that God's at work in all of this. He's at work not only revealing to Daniel what he's revealed, but he's at work in Daniel, giving Daniel a desire for understanding because God is going to communicate this to us. And God, in a sense, has already answered before Daniel has called. God, God is at work fulfilling the desires of this prophet before he even expresses his desires. I'm reminded of Isaiah 65, 24. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. This is not the only time in the book of Daniel where we see God fulfill Daniel's desires for understanding by answering with an angel. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and look at verse 20. Notice what we read there. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. I mean, as Daniel expresses his desire for understanding, Gabriel is dispatched and understanding is given. Look at chapter 10 and look at verse 10. Actually, let's look at verse 8, Daniel 10, verse 8. So I was left alone and saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand 
and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. And we'll get more into that passage when we get to Daniel chapter 10. Once again, you see an angel sent by God to answer the desires of Daniel's heart, to know, to understand the things that God's revealing. Look back at Daniel chapter 8. So Daniel has an awareness of a need to understand. God is going to answer with communication uh, by an angel. Notice, though, that this communication given through the angel is commanded by God. Verse 16 tells us this, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel... Make this man understand the vision. So uh, whose voice is that? Who is commanding Gabriel to make it known to Daniel? Well, that's God. And it raises a question, doesn't it? Why use an angel to communicate to Daniel when you've just made obvious that you can speak to Daniel directly? I mean, God doesn't need an angel to talk to us, does He? If God wants to, He can just speak directly. So why use the angel? And it reminds us of the, of the ministry of angels. What, what is the ministry of angels according to the, to the Bible in terms of uh, an association with us, with God's people? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 says this, And to which of the angels... Has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not, talking about the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? What do the angels do? They serve God by serving for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Salvation. They have a ministry with respect to God's people. God doesn't use the angels because He needs the angels any more than He uses us because He needs us. But it glorifies God to make use of the angels and it blesses the angels to be used by God. And so there are a lot of things in the Old and New Testaments that God could have done directly, but it was, to, it was His choice to glorify Himself by making use of these ministering spirits, and it blesses the creature when the Creator makes use of us. For example, the Bible is clear. We don't know all the details about it, but the Bible is clear that God used angels when He gave the Mosaic Law. Galatians 3.19 says this, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. It was put in place through angels. When God communicated to Moses, angels were present. Angels were in some way Involved. Acts chapter 7, verse 37 says this, This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. So as God communicated to Moses, he communicated and angels were involved. Acts chapter 7, verse 52. This is from Stephen's sermon before they stoned him to death. Acts 7, 52. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So God not only made use of an angel communicating with Daniel. God made use of an angel when communicating with Moses. God made use of angels when communicating the law. You see God using angels in the New Testament also, don't you? In fact, it is this angel, Gabriel, who announced the conception and the birth of John the Baptist. It was this angel, Gabriel, who announced the conception and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And we see angels at work in the early life of the church, Acts chapter 5, verse 17. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Acts 27, 21. And there are many others we could reference. These are just two. Acts 27, 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, I mean, they're on this, this voyage on a ship and a storm has blown up. And they're struggling. Looks like they're going to be lost at sea. And Paul says this, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship, And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we know that God can speak directly to his people if he chose to do so. In fact, it was the Son of God who stopped Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And yet on this ship, on this occasion, it was an angel of the Lord who said, don't be afraid, Paul. You've got to stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Paul went on to say, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. We must run aground on some island. So we see in God's Word that angels are real, and they're at work. Daniel has this awareness that he needs understanding. God answers his desire, communicating by an angel. Something I want you to notice about this communication, it was personal. End of verse 16. Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Verse 17, so he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. This is a very personal communication. First of all, this angel has a name, Gabriel. This is the first time in the Bible, by the way, that an angel is referred to by name. This angel has a name. We know from Scripture there are different kinds of angels. Seraphim, cherubim, thrones dominions, principalities, powers, archangels, all of those words are used in Scripture to describe angels. The fact that these creatures could have names reminds us that they are personal creatures. I mean, just like we are different persons and have different personalities, and thus we all have our own names, so the angels, in the case of Gabriel and Michael, they have names. In fact, it's not only Gabriel referred to in the book of Daniel. Michael is referred to also in Daniel chapter 10 and Daniel chapter 12. In the book of Jude, the ninth verse, it says, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So when we read about Gabriel and we read about Michael and we read about conversations... These are personal creatures. These angels have personalities. We also find they have individual assignments. Why is Gabriel here? Why why do we see him again in chapter 9? Because he's been dispatched. He has a job to do. He's sent by God in answer to prayer. He's sent by God in answer to the prophet's desires. And in fact, when you read further in Daniel, you, you see that angels seem to have a particular responsibility with respect to nations and peoples. Michael, for example, has a special relationship to the nation of Israel. This angel has a powerful presence 
Because when Daniel comes in contact with him, verse 17, it says he was frightened and he fell on his face. In fact, he goes into a deep sleep. We see it not only here, we see it read it a moment ago in chapter 9 also. Daniel is frightened by his appearance. This, this creature, this angel is glorious. And this is not the only place in the Bible where angels are described as having a glorious presence. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 5 says this, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. Mighty angels. Powerful Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, O you His angels, you mighty ones, who do His word, obeying the voice of His word. When Jesus was raised from the dead, and an angel made His appearance at the tomb, Matthew 28, 2 says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Personal creatures, Gabriel, Michael, conversing with men, having particular responsibilities. They are sent on assignments. They do the bidding of God. They obey the voice of His Word. A powerful presence. And they're powerfully used. You see here this angel strengthening Daniel to be able to receive what what, what the angel wanted to communicate. Verse 18, When he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. I mean, not only does he have the, the power to communicate God's word in this case, but the power of his touch imparts strength to the prophet. And we saw this later on in Daniel also. Daniel 10, look there again. I want to remind you of this. Verse 12, Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Now this is fascinating, these next few verses, because you, you see something going on behind the scenes that you would only see because God revealed it. Verse 13, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. I mean, this angel for 21 days is resisted by some spiritual being associated with the kingdom of Persia. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. 
but I will, I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Michael's association with the nation of Israel. So, our focus is not to be on angels, but on God. Yet, we have to ask, why is there so much information about angels in the Word of God? And why in some cases, like these chapters, is there so much detailed information about angels? I want to finish tonight by quickly giving you four reasons why I believe you see this kind of information about angels. First of all, angels testify to the greatness of God. To the greatness of God. You know, when you think about the universe that we can see, when you think about what God has created that we can see in our current state, it is easy to be impressed with the greatness of God, isn't it? You look at this creation under the heavens, and you see the vastness of all that God spoke into existence. You see the forest, you see the oceans, you see the mountains. You see all of this, and you realize God spoke it into existence. And then you look up into the heavens, and you see the stars. And now by means of telescopes and all the rest, you see far beyond what the human eye can see standing here on the earth. And you realize this universe that can be seen by the eyes of men, it is, it is far greater than one could ever imagine. And God spoke it into existence. Out of nothing, He brought it into existence and He hung it all on nothing except His Word. And He upholds it all by His Word. But now realize something, beyond this realm that we can see, in another realm, there's still a vast creation. We don't see the angels, but God tells us they are there. And there have been some, like Daniel and Moses and others, Paul, who have seen them and have told us that they are there. Do you realize that God not only rules over the world that you can see, He rules over a world that you can't see? But one day you will see. In that way, this testimony about angels speaks to us of the greatness of our God. And then when you consider that these are these angels, these holy angels, they're, they're holy creatures who have never sinned, and yet they hold our God in awe. They worship Him night and day. They cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They exist to do His will. These creatures are so great, so glorious, that men lose their strength in their presence, faint in their presence. And yet these same creatures that are so much greater than we are, that we can barely stand their presence, these same creatures have to cover their face and their feet in the presence of our God. What does that tell you about the greatness of God? Why does God tell us about the angels? Because their very existence teaches us about the vastness of everything that God has made and the fact that He rules over everything in heaven and on earth. It speaks to us about the greatness of God. Second, angels testify to the graciousness of God. They are sent out to do ministry on behalf of us. They are ministering spirits sent forth to do ministry on behalf of those who inherit salvation. Why? I mean, who are we that angels would attend to our needs? Who are we that angels would be dispatched throughout redemption history to communicate truth, to care for our safety? There's only one explanation for that. It's not explained by any greatness of our own. It's explained by God's grace. It's because God has seen fit to make us his children, the inheritors of salvation by the death of His Son. Rebels have been redeemed, and now we are the objects of His special care, even through the agency of angels. That's grace. In fact, there's a, a, an, an amazing verse in Matthew chapter 18 that warns about despising God's children. And it says this, Matthew 18 verse 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, and if you read that verse in its context, he's not talking about little children, though Jesus at times used little children to illustrate this. He's talking about his children, his spiritual children. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven 
Their angels always see the face of my Father who's in heaven. You be careful not to despise God's children, Jesus said, because their angels behold the face of God. These people are so precious to God, cared for by God in such a way that He has angels assigned to care for them. Because we know this about the angels, though there is a finite number of them, they are innumerable as far as we're concerned. Myriads of angels. Treating any fellow believer with contempt is extremely serious since God and the holy angels are so concerned for their well-being. Beloved, do you realize you're cared for by God through the agency of angels? The presence of those angels reminds us of the graciousness of God because who are we that He should care for us in such a way? Third, angels testify to the generosity of God. Because just as God does not need men, God does not need angels. God needs nothing outside of Himself. And so the fact that He would use angels simply points to the variety of ways that God has chosen to make Himself known, that God has chosen to glorify Himself, and it points us to the generosity of God in letting His creatures share in what He does doesn't have to use angels. Why does he use them? They get to share in the Creator's work. They get to care for us. Why do we get to do anything in the kingdom of God? Not because God needs us, but because in his generosity, he allows us the joy of sharing in what he does. You know, we've been talking about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians. Isn't it a glorious thought that your Creator has equipped you as a redeemed person. He has equipped you to serve Him, and he, He's so generous that He allows you to participate in what He's doing, though He could do it all without you. But He lets you share in it. And so when we, when we see the angels serving the Lord, we see the greatness of God, and we see the grace of God because they're serving people who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, and we see the generosity of God because He doesn't have to use anyone or anything, yet He allows the angels to serve Him, and He allows us to serve Him. There's a fourth thing, and the last thing tonight. Why so much information about angels? Because angels testify to the gentleness of God. Those angels, how, how many were sent to Lot? How many did we read about? Two. You have any, you have any family? You need to get them out of here. Why? Why? What were those angels about to do? Destroy an entire city. They're powerful, aren't they? When sent by God for that purpose, they can be agents of destruction. Egypt knew about that, didn't they? And yet, take note of how these angels deal with redeemed people. Look on the pages of Scripture and note when redeemed people have met with angels. And what do you see? You see that these angels deal with men gently in their frailty. Or someone as great as the Apostle John, about to prostrate himself before an angel, and that angel in gentleness with that Apostle's mistaken ideas in his frailty, what does he say? No, 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 stand up. Don't worship me. I'm just a fellow servant. Worship God. And here's Daniel more than once overcome by the presence of Gabriel. At one point later in the book, he says, I can't even talk. And what are these angels, what does this angel do? He touches him. And he imparts strength to him. And he communicates God's truth to him. And when you remember that these angels are simply doing the bidding of our God, then realize that angel's gentle way is a reflection of God's gentle way toward his people. They're simply reflecting our God's gentleness toward us. Next Wednesday night, we're going to see what Gabriel communicates in this interpretation. But tonight, as you think about who communicated God's message to Daniel, remember God's greatness. And remember God's graciousness. And remember God's generosity. And remember God's gentleness. Because He puts it on display even through His holy angels. Let's bow together for prayer. Father in heaven, thank You, Lord, for the things that You've revealed. Those things belong to us. We magnify and glorify You, not any of Your creatures. We thank You that Your holy angels testify to us 
about who you are. We give you praise tonight in Jesus' name.